Personality Traits, Part 4, Isink's Model of Personality. Professor Michael Botwin, Department of Psychology, California State University, Fresno. Hans Isink lived between 1960 and 1997. He became one of the leaders in personality theory in his day. He is also my mentor from afar and the person who inspired me to go into personality psychology. So I have a special part, spot for Isink and his work. Now, Isink was a controversial figure at times and he got into some things that are dubious, like studies in parapsychology. He didn't find anything. He also uh, took some money from the tobacco companies to show the good effects of smoking. Uh, despite his flaws, I think he came up with a fantastic theory of personality. Now, when I was an undergraduate, I went to the campus library as I had to write an extra credit paper on a personality theorist. Basically looked everybody up. I think had written the most books. So, not knowing anything about his theory, I started getting into it, started getting uh, into the theory, reading about what he was talking about. Uh, <laughs> went to the library, found out that he had the most books published about personality psychology. Didn't know anything about him at all before that, but as I started reading Eisenach's work, I became totally fascinated with personality theory in general and Isink's theory in particular. I just became totally, totally fascinated with the idea of the personality trait, its explanatory powerful, powerfulness, and its usefulness in defining human behavior. And I got a chance to meet Isink uh, a couple of times at conferences. Our first meeting was extremely awkward. I saw him standing off by the side by himself. Now, in Isink's writings, he writes very dynamically, but he always writes about what an introvert he is. My first encounter with Hans, well, if you remember from previous lectures, I've always called myself an introvert as well. So I was two introverts kind of fumbling around to try to have a conversation. He was extremely nice to me, and, uh, it was, to me, kind of an awkward moment. But it didn't diminish my fervor for finding out about personality. And I think has been one of my main inspirations because he takes a hard science approach to the study of psychology. And this is one of the things I find most inspiring and passionate about his work. It's the hard science edge. So, I think started off in Germany. He was born in Berlin in 1916. He emigrated during the Nazi era with his parents. His parents went to France. He ended up in England right before the outbreak of the Second World War. He was college-aged, and he wanted to go into a hard science. So as he writes in his biography, uh, he asked his advisor about physics. They wouldn't let a German national uh, become a student in a physics department uh, right before World War II, so that was out. Went through all of the other sciences and I think was denied a spot in them. And then in frustration, he says, well, what can I major in? And his advisor says, there's always psychology, which was a very fortuitous moment for psychology because I think went on, as I've said, to become one of the foremost 
personality theorist in his day. Now let's look at his model. It's typically just called Isink's model. Some people call it the Penn model because there are three traits, psychoticism, extroversion, and neuroticism. And one of the things that we also want to talk about with Isink's model is that he has three, what some people sometimes call super traits. And then below each one of those super traits are many sub traits. And you go down to the sub traits and you keep on going down level, level, you eventually get to behaviors. But Isink came up with this three dimensional model starting work in it in the 1940s it crystallized in the late 1960s early 1970s and went on to become one of the dominant theories especially in europe now let's talk about Isink's three traits the first trait i want to talk about is extroversion and this is where i get my shot to tell you all my extroversion stories i know i use extroversion as a trait way too much in class but it's the trait i know and love the most. So, Isink and extroversion. Now the thing that I like about Isink's model is he tries to draw back the foundations of each of his three traits to some kind of biological process. For extroversion, Isink and his followers have overwhelming evidence that extroversion is a very biological trait. It doesn't have a particular spot in the brain, but rather it shows up in the brain as a series of processing channels that together are called the ascending reticular activating system. Now the roots of the ARAS are deep in the brain, in the lower brain stem, the old brain, and the autonomic nervous system. Now the difference between a biological extrovert and a biological introvert in Isink's model is the speed of processing of information through the brain and nervous system. So basically information processes through a series of channels, not these arrows, but a series of channels. And those individuals who process information extremely quickly are biologically introverted. I know that sounds kind of counterintuitive to you. It did to me at first, too, because you think, well, extroverts do a lot more stuff than introverts, so their brains are going to work faster. It's actually the opposite. Now, extroverts have slower processing ARAS systems. Now, in reality, we're talking relative milliseconds. We're not talking about lag times of days, weeks, or months here. We're talking about milliseconds. But those milliseconds are enough to make significant differences in the behavior between an Isinkian extrovert and a Isinkian introvert. The basic finding from this research is that introverts get swamped with information because their brains suck everything in far more quickly than the extrovert does. And what happens? The extrovert tends to take a little while to process that information, and they're also looking for more information to get to an optimal level of arousal. Whereas the introvert sucking all the information in extremely quickly, and they're basically overstimulated. This is what causes the issues that introverts have with being socially withdrawn. They're basically sucking in way too much information. They get overloaded, and they have a hard time coping with that overreaction to the stimuli. So, that's the basic difference. There's been a ton of research, biological and social, that supports the contention that extroversion is extremely biological. 
It's also extremely heritable. As we'll learn in the Behavior Genetics Unit, about 70% of the variants in the population for introversion extroversion scores is genetic. So most likely if you're an extremely extroverted person you come from a long lineage of extremely extroverted people. If you're extremely introverted you most likely came from a lineage of people who are also introverted. In the next few slides we're going to look at some differences that Foslin and West describe about differences between introverts and extroverts. Now this is kind of watered down pop psychology kind of stuff, but I found the website several years ago and I added it to augment my lecture on extroversion, introversion because I thought the information there was extremely good. So let's take a look at Foslin and West's ideas about differences between extroverts and introverts. Let's look at some of the behavioral difference between Isinkian extroverts and Isinkian introverts. We'll start with the introverts. These are just some basic terms. So you tend to find Isinkian introverts to be introspective, serious, inhibited, performance interfered with by excitement, aroused but restrained, prefer solitary vocations, and have a high sensitivity to pain. Now your typical Isinkian extrovert has, sorry, I had to grab my pointer, these characteristics. They are impulsive, outgoing, they like novelty. Performance for them is enhanced by excitement. They prefer vocations where they contact lots of people and they have a high tolerance for pain. Here are some other things that show up as major differences between introverts and extroverts from an iSync perspective. Now iSync says that introverts are more socialized than extroverts are due to the speed of processing of the ascending reticular activating system. Essentially all you have to do is say bad introvert and they'll go cowering in the corner for several hours even if they haven't done anything wrong because they're sucking in all that stimulation. Extroverts kind of do whatever they want to because no level of stimulation will in fact cause them pain. This is why we also say with this uh, socialization bit that there's an ancillary corollary that introverts are more easily punished than extroverts are. So introverts you can punish them, extroverts punishment doesn't work. Let me give you a family story about why punishment doesn't work for your true biological extrovert. My 40 year old stepson James is an extremely uh, biolo extreme biological extrovert. I don't know of many more people more extroverted than James. He's a really good guy. I'm not knocking him in any way. But James has an incredibly good gift of gab. James can talk to anybody about anything for any amount of time. Now, to tell stories about school, we had basically the same parent-teacher conference with James from kindergarten to senior year in high school. James is a good kid, he just never shuts up. Here's a chronic point where it illustrates his uh, lack of quiet. When I was in graduate school, we were living in a neighborhood that had extremely poor schools. 
So my ex-wife and I, both being Catholic, decided to um, put James in the local Catholic school. We couldn't get him in. It was full by the time we made this realization about how lousy the schools were. But there were openings at the parish next door, which was in an area of Michigan called Beverly Hills, Michigan. Not really as rich as Beverly Hills, California, but a lot of, at the time, nouveau riche car money. So it was a very wealthy parish. Now, I was in my solid days in grad school, so there were some, some issues with that that uh, are other stories for other times. So we put James in to the school, and there is one particular nun that is a teacher, and in the 1980s, when this was happening, uh, it was rare that nuns would wear habits. These nuns still all wore habits. And it was a small school, about 300 kids. They had one grade of a uh, classroom grade for each one from uh, kindergarten through seventh. So, James gets in the class and he gets one year, actually two years, uh, with the most fearsome nun of the entire school. Sister, as the kids dubbed her, and I later learned was appropriate, Mean Jean. She was, to put it simply, the toughest penguin in the whole school. And James had her for class. He actually had Sister Jean for two years because the parents who were going to get Sister Jean the following year to teach their kids paid off the school with a big donation so that they wouldn't have to have Sister Jean for their kid's teacher. Shows you how feared people were of Sister Me and Jane. So, I'm at home one day, and it's one of those days I didn't have to go onto campus, so I'm working on my thesis, and I'm actually in a pretty good groove. The flow is going on. I'm actually pushing out some good words. The phone rings. Now, this is uh, way before any type of cell phone, and the high-tech solution of that day for telephone technology was the answering machine. So, being upset, the phone rang in the middle of the day and interrupted my work. I went to do the good screening of the calls. Heard it was Sister Mean Jean. Figured, kid might need me. Better pick it up. Pick up the phone, Sister Jean says. James is talking in church. Now, if you're not aware of the Catholic education system, one of the things you have to do if you're a student at a Catholic school is you go to Mass every day. It's a major part of the school day for the children. So, this is a horrendous thing. James is talking in church. Well, I just had my very first own class, my very first own class to teach the very first time in graduate school, and I thought I knew everything in the world about teaching. Well, over 30 years later, I've learned I don't know as much as I thought I knew then, but that's another story for another time. But James is talking in church. So, I'm trying to be good, and I tell sister... Oh, I'm so very sorry to hear that he's causing you some problems. What can we do to fix this? And so, being a solution kind of guy, I asked Sister Jean, I said, uh, well, why don't you move him away from the children that he's talking to? And she gruffly says, I did that. And I said, she's still talking, you still talking? He goes, she goes, yes. And we go through several iterations of this. And then finally, I say, Well, sister, if he's that much of a problem, why don't you just sit him right next to you during Mass? And she goes, He's sitting next to me. Now, I'm getting a little flustered with this whole thing. And I'm wondering what's going on. 
So I ask Sister Jean the question that you're probably thinking of right now. Who is he talking to? At which time Sister told me, me. She was, he was sitting there, James was there, having a conversation during Mass to Sister Jean, and Sister Jean bought into it and was talking back to him and having this conversation. Now my guess, and I don't have data to support this one, is the priest probably saw Sister Jean talking to James during Mass, and Sister Jean probably got yelled at by the priest for talking during Mass herself, and she had to get it out of her system and let the excrement roll downhill. But um, this church would have been right out of a George Carlin comedy sketch about Catholicism. And it was extremely conservative, so any breaches in social etiquette were extremely frowned upon. Literally saw two women about to go to fisticuffs because at the time the Catholic Church had just said you could put a host in your hand and then put it in your mouth. Some of the people there thought it was offensive to have the body of Christ in your palm of your hand and others wanted to accept the new rules. Very, very conservative. Uh, so James got in trouble. I got a great introversion, extroversion story out of it. But it only shows that you can't punish the extrovert. We've had tons of student uh, parent conversations with James when he was going through school. And at one teacher conference, the teacher says, well, you should ground him. He said he's grounded. You should take away TV, as in had TV. You should take the toys out of his room. The toys are out of his room. The only thing we left for the kid in his room when he was grounded were his books and his bed and his clothes, naturally. But you can't punish the true biological extrovert. The can never get enough stimulation to feel badly about what they've done. You pretty much have to clobber them, and that's kind of not a cool thing either. So how do you get your average everyday extrovert to fall into line, and how do you get them to behave? Well, whereas your Isinkian introverts run off of punishment, your Isinkian extroverts will work for rewards. And for some reason, the reward centers in their brain are a bit more sensitive. They're very into reward systems. So with James, we constantly had token economies of one thing or another trying to get him to behave. You find that the people in criminology very fascinated by the concept of extroversion, introversion. As you can imagine, our prisons are not full of biological introverts. I would imagine that if you looked at the mean level of extroversion in the prison system, it would be much higher than that of the normal population. People have done that study, found it before. I'm sure it would consistently stay uh, as a valid finding. But what you find is that, think about our prison system. We take people who do the wrong thing, we lock them up to punish them. Punishment doesn't work. They come out oftentimes uh, considering getting their criminal education in prison. So what does the prison system do to keep the system in line? They reward the prisoners. Most common reward? time off for good behavior. So you lock somebody up to punish them, but then you reward them to be good when, you're, when they're there by shortening their sentence. That's just how things work. Another case in point of differences between 
Isinchian extroverts and Isinchian introverts is that introverts are more easily conditioned through Pavlovian methods than extroverts are. It gets to the sensitivity of the nervous thing again. In fact, we find significant differences in eye blink conditioning responses between introverts and extroverts. Uh, they have a device where you put on a phony set of glasses that has two small tubes that blow a micro puff of air into the participant's eye. And you can condition this eye blink conditioning. Sorry for the redundancy of the redundancy. But what you find is that the introverts condition quickly. The extroverts also can be conditioned to eye blink responses, but it takes a bit longer. You also find that generally introverts are morning people, extroverts are night owls. I, as probably the most prototypical introvert around, am a night owl though. I think that's the long days of working and going to school as an undergraduate. We also find that introverts have higher levels of arousal in the morning. Generally, arousal increases for both introverts and extroverts during the day. And that extroverts get more aroused as the day goes later. A couple of fake posters here. But there's some valid stuff. How to care for your introverts. Respect them, never embarrass them in public. Don't interrupt them. Enable them to find one best friend. Teach them skills privately. I'll let you look at this on your own. How to care for your extrovert. Respect their independence. Compliment them. Extroverts are suckers for compliments, folks. Let them dive into things. Give them options. Uh, let them shine. Extroverts really like to shine. So that is a bit on iSync introversion and extroversion. In a later video, I'm going to talk more about some differences from a specific article about extroverts and introverts and their biological differences. But I want to move on now and talk about the other two traits in iSync's model. The first is neuroticism. And neuroticism is also sometimes called emotional stability. You find that you get extroversion and neuroticism in most trait models. It's part of two of the three traits in this model, and it's two of the five traits in the five-factor model personality. Now, an Isink's model of personality from a biological perspective Neuroticism is located in the visceral or old brain. In those areas like the amygdala, the septum, and all that stuff where you get high sympathetic nervous system activity. Basically, let's look at some of the behaviors uh, and problems that can happen if you're a super strong neurotic. And that's Isink's neuroticism, not just neurotic clinical behavior. So, high neurotics have sleep problems, anxiety, and depression. They overreact to negative emotions, and they're ruminators. They have trouble returning to an even keel after an emotional event. They drag things on forever. I'm not necessarily high on neuroticism, but I'm very good at ruminating. Remember that one. Uh, neurotic folks also tend to stay long, angry longer after a perceived transgression. They're less likely to forget people who they think have violated them. And they're more likely to be vigilant to social threats such as exclusion. So they've got a very, very, uh, 
touch the short touchy emotionality trigger what about those low in neuroticism my poster child for low in neuroticism the character Ben Stein plays uh, going all the way back to fast times at Ridgemont High he played the ultimate non-emotional teacher so low neurotic individuals tend to be extremely emotionally stable they're even tempered calm slow to react to stressful stimuli and they bounce back quickly after negative events they can also be what's called emotionally bland or rigid and just not be affected much by emotional stimuli the last of i think's three traits is psychoticism now psychoticism he formulated later on in the model and he doesn't have a specific biological location for psychoticism. Rather, he says psychoticism is related to hormones, especially male hormones, most likely testosterone. So individuals who score high on psychoticism tend to be high in testosterone. They lack monoanalyse oxide which is that chemical that if you have too much of, you don't seek out any stimulation. So high psychoticism people seek out stimulation. And their nervous systems, autonomic nervous systems, aren't really stable. Psychoticism has also been called antisocial personality, psychopathic personality. In an interview near the end of his life, I think said, that psychoticism was probably a bad name for that trait. He adopted it because he was working at a research hospital when he devised that part of his theory. And he says that tough-mindedness uh, versus tender-mindedness might be a better label for this trait as it's got to do with how well you deal with reality. Let's look at some high psychoticism score behaviors. They're solitary, often loners. They don't have any empathy and they can be cruel. They're insensitive to the pain and suffering of others, even kin. And they like violent stuff, whether it's films, paintings, photographs. They score high on Machiavellianism scales. Now, the Machiavellian scale is also called the F scale for fascist scale, were scales devised by a group of psychoanalysts after World War II, trying to understand how you could get someone to do a job like a Nazi death camp guard. And they came up with the Machiavellian scale. Uh, the basic way that the Machiavellian personality works is these people are very obedient to authority and very submissive to authority. But when they have to be authoritarian, they're extremely harsh and rash and can be violent doing that. They like promiscuous and hostile sexual attitudes. They endorse those they may get involved in the heinous act of date rape by playing sexual partners with lots of drinks. They're cynical about religion and they have tendencies towards uh, all kinds of fun stuff, violence, theft, vandalism, and general criminal behavior. As you would imagine, uh, there are certain groups that score extremely high on psychoticism. And as my crim colleagues will tell you, there is a very strong link between psychoticism scores and being incarcerated. In other words, incarcerated prisoners have far higher on average P scores than the unincarcerated male population. There's another group that scores differentially on psychoticism and as politics has been a major concern over 
the last period of time and I don't see it going away. Let me tell you about this study that was done in the 1960s by Isink and some of his colleagues. They looked at psychoticism scores of three different types of politicians at the time in the British government. They looked at conservatives, moderates, and liberals. And they had these individuals fill out one of Isink's personality questionnaires that measured psychoticism. Well, they found a very interesting relationship between extreme political views and psychoticism. Let me show it to you. Here we have uh, moderate politicians have the lowest level of psychoticism and the extreme liberal and conservative ends of the political spectrum have very high psychoticism scores. Now, I'll let you figure out your own political affiliations and stories about this, but basically both extremely conservative and extremely liberal politicians have a poor grasp on reality. That's one of the things that make them such ideologues. I uh, want to show you one last study in Isink's personality area. Now there are a ton of these studies that have been done, but it shows the usefulness of having multiple dimensions of personality and being able to plot things on them. Study was done in the 1960s by Isink and Rockman, and what they did was they got a hold of a group of children who had been labeled as having conduct problems in the English school system. So I think had them fill out personality questionnaires and then looked at how the different problems fell into the dimensional space of introversion, extroversion versus stability, which is the intersection of the line with extroversion to extreme neuroticism. And Isaac and Rockman found something very interesting. They found that there were two major axes of these problems. One were problems having to do with introversion and neuroticism. These are kind of self-destructive problems the kids were dealing with. The other were neurotic but extroverted problems. And these are generally behavior problems that in some way uh, was an act against another person or institution or something. So let's look here. Psychoneurotic is way up there in the introversion range. Depressed, irritable, nervous, irresponsible, daydreaming inferiority and then we get truant uh, showing up there but let's not talk about truancy yet I oh, can't get it to go away there truancy is gone it's not true look at these set of problems here these are all self-destructive things I know a lot of school teachers in the modern school system and they would probably be happy to have kids that only had those kind of problems. But they're self-destructive. They're not against other people. Truancy, really not against other people either, unless you're doing damage and vandalism and stuff like that. But you have to be kind of extroverted to buck the system and leave school when you're supposed to be there. Stealing, that's definitely a gact against other people. Being rude, again, one of those behaviors that I think teachers would be happy if it was the only thing they had to tolerate today in the K through 12 system. Egocentric, temper tantrums. My favorite here, fantastic lying. I don't know what the operational definition of fantastic lying, but maybe it's something like well, I was coming to school, and on my way I got abducted by aliens. They took me to their home planet, 
and we did all kinds of stuff there and they brought me back 15 minutes late to school because the time warp didn't work right. Must be something like that, I don't know. But you can get a feeling for how you can lay in behaviors and many studies have laid in behaviors into the two space here. Uh, vocations, as you would imagine, there are behaviors or excuse me, occupations that go in the introversion neurotics thing, uh, people who would be better off working alone. And then there are the extroverted occupations, people working with other people. So I find Ising stuff extremely interesting. It's kind of rolled into other theories and uh, there aren't fortunately too many pure Isinkians around anymore. Uh, but that started my journey into personality psychology was the study of these traits. Now in our next unit we're going to get back to introverts and extroverts and I'm going to steal some stuff from a website written by Foslin and West. We'll talk about some more differences between introverts and extroverts because I can and I like talking about introversion and extroversion. So we'll see you on our next installment of Personality Psychology. Bye now. This has been a We Have Couches video production, copyright 2020, Professor Michael Botwin, all rights reserved.